I'd like to call this meeting of the South Burlington School Board to order. Um, uh, thank you for joining the South Burlington School Board Zoom meeting. With a large number of participants, clear meeting procedures are needed so we can conduct school board business in an orderly fashion and include the community at the same time. <laughs> Um, I will facilitate the meeting. I'm Bridget Burkhart. Um, chat is disabled. Written questions can be submitted via the Q&A function in Zoom. Written questions will be answered at the end of the meeting if time permits. It's usually actually at the end of each item. We will try to answer our written questions um, with regard to the item they pertain to. It's to school board at sbschools.net and we will respond as soon as possible. Anyone wishing to speak will be able to do so by using the raise hand feature in Zoom. Uh, participants who raise their hand uh, will be called on to the best of our ability in the order that they raise their hand. Please be ready to unmute yourself and speak when it's your time to speak. If we can't hear you, we will move on after a few moments to get to as many people as possible. If your question is answered or you no longer want to speak via audio, please use the lower hand feature in Zoom. We have a capacity for up to 500 participants. If you can't connect, it could be because we're at the capacity limit, um, or at, the, at our limit, sorry. If you're having problems connecting or need help using Zoom, please go to http uh, colon forward slash forward slash support dot zoom dot us for additional help. Um, and please limit public comments to the meeting agenda topics. Um, please submit all other comments to the school or school board via our website or email. Uh, once the school board begins taking questions from the community, the format will be, <clears throat> um, well, well, we have not really been adhering to this, I'm sorry. Um, so we've been trying to make as much time as we can for questions to make sure that everyone's getting their questions answered. I did just wanna make clear that for each item, um, typically there is a presentation by administration first, then the board has time to talk to one another and ask questions of administration or ask questions of whomever presented. And then we will open it up um, and take community questions. Um, so with that, unless anyone has anything to add, um, I will uh, move on to agenda item number three, which is comments from the public regarding items not on the agenda. Do we have any comments from the public regarding items not on the agenda? Okay, I, I see no hands raised. Colin Delaney. Okay. And I have no questions. Um, so I believe that we will move on um, to uh, item number four, amendments to the agenda. We have none, um, uh, Bridget. Okay. Then we'll move on to item number five, announcements, student representative report. And I see that Cole and Delaney are on. So do you guys wanna take it away, please? It looks like Delaney's just hopping on. Hi, Cole. Um, Hi, how are you guys? Good. All right, I'm on. Uh, so I can start with the first announcement. Um, the SBHS National Honor Society raised a thousand dollars for the Cots Walk, what an annual group service activity for this chapter. This year, the walk and fundraising was almost 100% online. Um. Continuing on with that, AP exams start next week for the high school students. Um, and as Taryn Turner the from the class of 2021 was the Vermont All-State Music Festival Vocal Performance Scholarship recipient, she, with the help of Ms. Bushy and Frank Whitcomb, her accompanist, created a video of what would have been her performance if the festival had happened this upcoming weekend. The video will be available on Ms. Bushy's Twitter page soon. And that is all for, from us. Okay, great. David, want, are there any other announcements? Yes, um, I would like to just recognize um, our teachers. Today is um, uh, Teacher Appreciation Day. And um, I wanted to just obviously share that although they're not in the building, um, they're certainly with us all and um, supporting our students. So again, I'm, I have been, you know, and continue to be impressed. I get many, many comments that are coming back from 
uh, our parents um, about just uh, how impressed they are with the teachers, um, their passion and their resiliency to serve the students and to do the very best they can um, has been really um, Im impressive. I'm not surprised, but again, I think it's worthy on this particular day to appreciate the teachers and all that they have done in South Burlington to help our students. Uh, in addition, um, it's also um, uh, National um, School Nurses Day as well. And uh, our nurses, as you know, have played a major role um, on an ongoing basis, but have also, um, this, this as of recent, have been playing a really, really important role in helping us, um, you know, get through the, the COVID-19 issues and to plan for the future in probably different ways than, than we all know. Can act as liaisons to our school community, our families, healthcare providers, um, uh, kind of that liaison between uh, between all of them. They certainly understand the link between health and learning, uh, and are in the position to make positive differences every day. Again, so um, my hats go off to um, the teachers and the nurses, uh, as this is Appreciation Day for them, and I know um, school board members um, are similar in that. So thanks. Move on to item number six, city and school collaboration. Um, I, um, I don't have any additional updates from the last meeting other than an admittance that I missed the Monday meeting. I was supposed to be at the Monday meeting and um, I, I, my phone uh, died while I sat and Zoomed all day long and um, I never got in. So Kevin Dorn is I think gonna invite me into the next Monday meeting, the 8th to do again just a another budget update like I did the last meeting but the uh, true confessions with the board that I missed the meeting I missed the meeting and um, I'll make it on I think Monday the 18th is their next one so um, um, again I'll just be sharing that update as far as our other one um, I haven't uh, we haven't scheduled um, or we haven't talked um, Elizabeth and I haven't talked about our next meeting with um, Helen and Kevin yet, but we will be doing that soon. Thanks. Great. Uh, item number seven, the superintendent's report. Yeah, so um, again, not a lot to update on the first two bullet points, uh, and I'll let Gary speak to those in, this, in, in just a second. Um, Clearly, I think um, with the governor's uh, easing of the conditions, that's certainly allowed for a little bit more work to happen on, um, you know, on, on Rick Marcotte for sure. But I'll let Gary speak to that. Gary, I don't know if you have any additional updates from the, the last meeting and the stormwater work that's been pushed forward. Yeah, uh, good evening um, for the 180 Market Street project. Um, Obviously, restrictions are easing. As of the 11th, they'll be able to put as many people on the job as they feel they need is the minimum number to get the job done on schedule. Um, in talking to Mark, there there is some question with all the um, restrictions easing, whether they'll have availability for any more people than they currently have on the job. So, so they're going to continue to work like they have been. They're, they've got a good size crew on the ground. Seems like they're making good progress. For um, the FAA grant and Chamberlain noise mitigation, there, there's been no real development except uh, the Jones Payne, um, the architectural firm out of Boston that, that Jones Payne retained. They did reach out and contact me. I provided the information on class sizes, demographics um, for the Chamberlain School. And that was supposedly the last information that they needed to do um, their full cost estimate and analysis. Thank you, Gary. Any questions from the board on those two items? Good to go. Next one is just um, the COVID update, um, economic and legislative. Um, so currently the economic conditions, we've not really, we haven't received a any newer update. I'm gonna just share you this. Can you see this? Can you guys yeah, see that? Yeah, we can yeah. see it. So this is um, 
this is, and I can send this to you board members as well, and we can post it up, but this is um, basically letting you know that um, about one, about $1.25 billion have come into the state. Uh, of that, a uh, certain amount is expected to come into the ED fund, um, not really clear. Um, here again, it gives a little bit more descriptive. Vermont is forecasted to receive 31 million. 90% um, of these funds will, will go to LEAs, um, local education agencies. State education is SEA. Um, it's unclear how the funds, but right now they're talking about about 80% of your title funds, although that's still not solidified. So again, I don't have a lot of what I would say concrete information. Um, and then there's this governor's emergency education relief fund um, and talks a little bit about that. There is a, the 4.4 million in here that it, that talks about right here um, for that emergency education relief fund. So that's um, that's where we are related to that. That's the that was I think posted late last week. Um, again, continuing to look out for for that as well. Um, the legislative information is most specifically tied to the legislative activity that we've had both in the House and the Senate. Um, and let me just see if I can share that one with you too. I don't know. Of course, I didn't have that one nicely open. Um, as you know, we testified, um, Bridget and I, I don't, it seems like a while ago now. Um, to my outlook. I'm coming. All right, and let me share. This keeps minimizing on me, Steve. Exit minimize, there we go. Sorry for my Zoom practice here, folks. Share, there we go. So this is actually um, a prepared document by their legislative council. <clears throat> I, find, I found it helpful and again, I'll send it out to board members as well and we'll post it, but um, the House Education Committee and the Senate Education Committee and um, kind of in parallel what those documents look like. Um, obviously, um, goes back to either previous year spend and then give some time frames. Again, I think this is fairly consistent with what uh, has been shared um, previously. There's currently work going on. I know uh, I didn't see any activity today. I'm not sure about the calendar ahead for this week. Uh, I have been updated a little bit from um, the Vermont Superintendents Association. Um, I know that this is in the in the queue currently. And so um, I do know that board members have, have provided some advocacy to, to the um, relevance to not keeping things at the current year spend. Uh, given um, the pressures uh, that that exist, and again, that's consistent for the other 18 districts as well, as well as the rest of the state um, um, school districts and SUs as well. So I don't, I don't, I can send this to you again. This was a little bit of a deeper dive on what's going on between the health, House and the Senate bills out there. Again, I don't know. If folks have questions or other feedback. I did just want to share, I mean, we've had some questions from community members about our testimony <clears throat> and about those bills. And I did just want to share, as David alluded, there are 18 other districts um, that also find themselves without approved budgets at this stage. And some of them are in the situation where either they can't have a vote um, in their traditional format because some of them still vote by voice. And so they would completely have to change voting procedures um, to Australian ballots and, and completely revamp how they do that. Um, some of them have town clerks that are not um, being as helpful um, as our town clerk and our board of civil authority are being. So they are in a situation where they simply may not be able to vote at all. Um, and they still have to figure out how to set a budget for next year. And much like us, if they default to a level funded budget, that's gonna mean significant cuts in the programming that they're able to offer. Some of those schools are Act 46 schools that are trying to merge and that are making very big changes to 
uh, buildings to, you know, trying to ch make changes to grade structure, you know, in terms of which grades are grouped together, all of these pretty big changes. And if they end up having to level fund from last year, um, they are going to have to make significant cuts. The other thing that would happen if they level funded is they would be, um, all of us, if we end up level funding, would be in a, a tricky position because we know um, that for the 2021-2022 school year, after all the dust has settled a little bit and we understand what federal money there is and we understand what the actual economic picture looks like for the long term for Vermont uh, a little bit better, there is going to have to be some kind of statewide discussion about what education funding looks like. And if our school districts, these 19 of us that don't have budgets, end up level funding for the 2021 school year, we start off at a much different, uh, at a different, on a different, completely different playing field than those districts that actually passed budgets. Um, the districts that passed budgets um, had an average increase in ed funding, the draw on the ed fund of about 4% which is very close to what we're proposing in the budget that we've got before the community right now. Um, and, and the House version, the House, as we testified to them, just emphasized that they felt that, that school districts um, were in a better, and school boards were in a better situation to know what the resource needs were in those districts than anybody in Montpelier. And that's why they were trying to make some flexibility um, in case it's not possible for a budget to be passed. David and I also emphasized though, uh, both of us, that uh, we would much prefer for there to be a budget that is voted on by the South Burlington voters. And we are in a very lucky position um, with a very helpful board of civil authority and town clerk who are willing to do what they need to do to make this election happen in May. And potentially, if the board decided, if that budget doesn't pass, potentially another one in June. Um, and we had, in our testimony, asked that they extend the deadline by which schools need to have budgets in place um, out beyond June 30, because really the state is pressuring everyone to have a budget of some kind, whether it's level funded or whether it's voted on or whether it's something in the fallback in either whichever bill gets put forward or whichever version gets passed. Um, because they want to know um, by August when Martin and his colleagues go back um, to vote on the overall state budget and, and you know, finish up some of these issues in August, they really need to know um, what the total resource request is from school districts. So there's this kind of balance between wanting all the communities to really have as much time as possible to vote, but then also the state having to figure out this, this gap in the Ed Fund and how it's going to be filled if they don't have more information about what those proposed budgets are, um, they're in kind of a, a tricky position. So that's just a little bit more color on, you know, some of the discussions that have been going on at the, the state level amongst the districts that don't have budgets yet. Um, and, and I had just been asked some questions about David and my testimony um, on um, the 24th. And I just wanted to give that little additional color. Yeah, Bridget, can I? Add to that, sure. yeah. Um, yeah. In addition to that testimony, um, I don't know, David, if you submitted anything as well on the, at the request of DSA, but um, I know Bridget and I both submitted um, comments to, which largely reflect that testimony, um, to both our uh, our Senate representatives and House representatives, really um, just highlighting both an interest and intent to uh, take a budget to the community for a vote but also the rationale of the, the impact of um, level funding as well. So um, I know there's been some concern from the community. Uh, again, I think we've heard different descriptions of it in the past, but just the um, notion of staff impact. And um, I just wanna reinforce that when 80 plus percent of your budget is um, related to wages and benefits, to look for a, a significant enough cut to um, reach level funding, we would absolutely have to be looking at staff associated with programming. Um, and, uh, you know, arguably at the end of the day, the, the impact of that and where it goes is certainly subject to administration's recommendations as it has been with the reduced budget that we voted on last week. But, um, that, that really is the primary place to look at in terms of any material reduction 
uh, and why we were not supportive of strictly a level funding for those districts and supervisory unions that don't have approved budgets right now. Are there other board thoughts or questions? Um, I see that there's at least one question from the public and, and maybe I haven't checked to see if their hands raised, but um, yes, Martin. Yeah, so, so uh, yeah, I agree with, uh, with what we're trying to do as far as to give some flexibility, but, but also want to emphasize again uh, that we want to have a budget that is put before the community and is voted on. Uh, the, one of the problems could be is if, if we're unable to have a vote at all, what do we do? Uh, and, and I would like to see, have some flexibility to figure that out. I mean, right now we are pushing towards May 28th, and I know that David's going to be talking about that a little bit uh, in a moment, but um, the latest uh, draft, I believe, that uh, the Ed Committee, the House Ed Committee is looking at does not include an extension of uh, the date for voting beyond June 30th. Uh, that's something that I'll certainly uh, weigh in on and, and, and push to give a little more flexibility uh, so that if necessary, we'll have one more shot if, if the May 28th budget does not pass or if, if it's further postponed because uh, things go bad again as far as uh, coronavirus. Things seem to be plateauing and such, but we keep on hearing that as things are, uh, as the restrictions are loosened, we might see an So it's about flexibility, but it's, I think they're, the board really has a commitment of having the public vote on our budget and hopefully we'll get this next one passed because it's, I think, uh, quite a reasonable budget given all the situation that we're dealing with, so. Thanks for that, Martin. Any other board members before I check with the public? Okay. Um, the only question or comment we have written is Trisha Gustafson says, thanks Bridget, very helpful additional color about the bigger picture of the budget process, the bills, the testimony, et cetera. I'm just checking for any um, raised hands and I see none. Um, so David, I think you can move on yes, yep. with the rest Thank, of the, the update. Thank you, Bridget. So mm -hmm. um, the next, again, thanks for giving me the opportunity to just give an update. Again, not, not a lot of solidification with COVID-19 stuff. Um, and that's consistent with the next bullet point, end of the school year. Um, we still are awaiting guidance. Um, I reported to you, I think last Wednesday, uh, that Patrick Burke and I filled out a end of the year graduation uh, kind of concerns, questions um, from an operational perspective, you know, what are we going to do? How could we do this? So all of that survey information went in from us and from other districts. We're waiting to hear um, some guidance specific um, from the secretary and the governor related to end of the year related activities um, and graduation um, celebrations, et cetera. So um, don't have any anything updated on that, uh, then uh, I'll keep you posted board on if I do hear something between now and the next board meeting. Uh, next bullet point is the enrollment update. And um, let me go to the share here on that. I think I'm okay, Steve, I got it, I think. Wait, I can talk, I can talk to it maybe. So um, this is posted. I'll post this also to the website. What I did here is just to try to give you a little bit of some history. So what you see in front of you is as of May 4th yesterday, um, enrollments um, and where they are. But I also, I think felt that I was hearing some of you talk more about, um, you know, what's been kind of the, the run rate over the, over the course of the year. So um, you can go all the way back to the October 1st one, which was close to the census. And so from the October 1st, when you look at all of the data up and down um, on the 2020, we're plus 17 students. Obviously it has some pluses and minuses. We've got more pluses going on at the elementary level. Um, and then um, for our projections for 2021, uh, we're projecting um, additional 40 from where we are. So, um, you can kind of just, as I'm giving you perspective is from October 1, you can look through all of the, each of schools, um, what we had for actual enrollments um, 
all the way back to the October 1st. Um, but again, I just want to give you a little bit more of a picture, but certainly this, what this represents, what you have here um, is um, showing about plus 90 um, over the, over uh, versus the May 2020 uh, number. So anyway. So I don't know what questions, again, I just try to give a little, I didn't do a great math job on each one of them, but um, just wanted to give you a little history about where we are for Rick Marcotte. Again, a couple of the quick things, just um, enrollment right now, um, as of May 4, you know, we've got some pretty significant enrollment as of right now um, at Rick Marcotte, 396. Um, at Chamberlain, 271, pretty consistent. Orchard um, at 428 and um, elementary district at 1,095. Um, Tuttle, um, 535 and um, high school, 932. And so um, you can see kind of where, where we are in, the, in that proposed and uh, current cycle. So I don't know if that's helpful to you. I'm gonna keep at it. Um, Again, it's, we have been taking active attendance every day. Again, thanks to the teachers. Uh, it happens in a little different manner. We get a lot of morning meeting times, but if a student doesn't make the morning meeting, then we may see them uh, by other teachers or their own teacher, depend elementary, middle, and high school, to be able to take attendance, to be able to account for them. Also, you know, work that's going back and forth, that's been allowing us to do that. I'm taking and in the same methodology through PowerSchool. So we've been actively, um, you know, using that as as a or a tool for that. So and then, you, um, yes, sorry. Uh, just a quick question. So, so what is I? Um, it's hard to look at the chart there, but um, yeah, I know. Uh, on the screen. But what is the um, uh, the current um, enrollment versus what was um, determined in the budget? So we, it's pretty close, Elizabeth. Um, there's not a lot of uh, deviation from what we uh, proposed the budget. We're up a little bit um, on enrollments over what we, but not significant. Um, it's in the, you know, in the teens. So it's definitely not under what That's we correct, said. not under, no. Thank you. And, and again, the volatility as the board's always heard, it's like broken record around the kindergarten numbers. Right now, Rick Marcotte, we're watching. We have a lot of registered kindergartners. Last year we had over uh, at Orchard was our big surprise last year um, where we had the 80, 85 registered. That number has gone down to 82 currently, but 85, we've, we've hardly ever seen, um, you know, kindergarten numbers coming in at, in that near 80 category. So that's positive news, but also, you know, just watchful news on, on enrollment, which speaks, I think, uh, specifically to, to the budget uh, related needs, particularly at Rick Marcotte and, um, and, and Chamberlain in that order. Uh, next was just a, uh, an update on the voting. Um, before, again, you do that, before you do that, uh, I just, I'm going to emphasize, and you already did, but not to put too fine a point on it, the fact that we have an enrollment increase of 90 students for next year is a big reason why uh, level funding just is not an option for providing appropriate education to the community students. So, sorry, go ahead. The, the last bullet point on my report was just a, an update on voting. Um, um, I am, again, we were lucky to have Donna on last meeting and um, she has posted um, the announcement on um, Front Porch Forum and we posted that information up too that you know, that they met on April 22nd and the process that they're gonna use for voting, all of our three voting sites will be open. Uh, they're strongly encouraging um, absentee, early voting via absentee ballot. Again, we gotta make sure we say that because they can't go in right now to the city offices. They can request early voting by asking for a absentee ballot. Um, and so it just spells out that um, as, um, you know, as kind of the process. And she, again, Don has been helpful. Uh, Deline has been helpful in orchestrating that. Um, and we'll be talking, our warning um, meetings, um, you know, we have to post those in eight locations. And again, Deline has been on top of that as well, uh, complying with what we have to do. Uh, in David, have we, 
Have we talked to Donna about coordinating in terms of what we're putting in the other paper? And do we have a draft yet of an ad to go in the other paper? Yeah, so, yep. so, and I'll share that with you too. We put out some, we updated, again, Amity has, has um, updated our chart similar to what we did before. Um, we wanted to make all three publication deadlines. So we rushed to get one in um, for this, this round, uh, this next cycle, which isn't tomorrow, I believe it's the following Thursday. Um, and then the remaining two additional ones. And so we can talk more about, we wanted to emphasize the Board of Civil Authorities um, decision on voting. And we wanted to share with folks um, our, our current budget uh, status in a, in a similar format. Um, we, we will, I do have it uh, scheduled to talk at some point with you folks on what you wanna, what additionally you wanna make, you may wanna include in Kind of budget communications, but we didn't want to miss this opportunity. So it's a fairly similar format to bridge it to what we did um, prior. Okay. So that's what I have on on um, on voting. Again, I don't know if any other questions are out there. Front porch forum. So. Yep, I see no um, I see no questions from the public on this last couple of items. Any other questions from the board before we move on? Nope. Okay, we'll move on to item number eight. Consider school board meeting schedule for 2020-2021 school year. This is more in for action for tonight. So again, it went out and in the packet to, to you board members. I don't know, um, we, we do at times alter some of our meetings, but this is kind of the consideration and opportunity for uh, perhaps keeping Zoom as an available option, even if we are holding regular meetings, is certainly something we're wanting to consider for, for additional involvement. Uh, Bridget, sorry. You know, later in July or make that July 8th meeting a full meeting if we need to. I'm just a little bit concerned given how things are in flux that if we basically take that month off, which is what we've done in the past, that we might not be prepared uh, for the fall if the fall has significant changes that we need to deliberate on. I think it's a good point. Um, typically what we do is kind of the new calendar, you know, our new year starts July 1. So um, I'm, I hope we don't tire you out in the month of June. <laughs> Uh, with meetings or special meetings that are needed, but um, I think certainly that's a consideration, uh, Bridget, that we can talk about. Again, the, the idea of this was the, the calendar is to, for people to get them on their schedule, community, um, to be able to get them on their schedule for those folks that are interested and kind of plots that out. We're able to post those up on our website. Um, certainly, if we need more, we can add more um, to your point, I think, in, in that month of July, if we need to, or August. Yeah I, would, I would yeah. yeah, I would concur. I think we need to keep the option open for additional meetings. And I think in, in my mind, David, under your superintendent's report, the same way we're talking about the end of the school year, I think we're going to have to add a bullet that's startup. Yeah. Because I think there'll be a lot of guidance um, uh, for all schools about sort of how to effectively start up and prepare staff and buildings and students for coming back. Okay. So I, my suggestion would be if you're open to taking action that would allow us to do that with the caveat obviously that we can add additional meetings on a case by case basis as needed. Just make sure there are no questions or other comments before we do that. I see none. Um, so do I have a motion to approve the school board meeting schedule uh, for the fiscal year 2020-2021? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Further discussion? Motion passes. Okay, uh, we will move on to um, item number nine, executive limitations policy monitoring. 
Warn for action, um, and although it is the first time we've looked at it, um, this go round, uh, curriculum development and review. So David, thank you, you Bridget. Want to take it away or is yep, Mike going to sure. take it away? So Mike's Mike's uh, going to join in here in just a second, but let me just um, start out here with again. Um, Kind of the expectations around monitoring reports. Again, the monitoring is specific to um, giving feedback back to uh, the superintendent. It's about um, adhering to meeting our ends. And this is a monitoring report, which we call 2.10 curriculum development in review. And so superintendents shall not, this is the way monitoring reports are um, um, worded, shall not allow the district to be without written curricula aligned with Vermont standards and the district ends policy that are coordinated across all grade levels. Further, the superintendent shall not fail to review the curricular, curricular periodically based upon student performance results, learning opportunities data, new research, and updated content knowledge with the goal of all students meeting the district ends. And so what, what we've put together here uh, for, for board uh, today is again, looking at um, adherence to whether there's reasonable interpretation, adequate data, and in compliance with those. I've got Mike on uh, this evening um, to answer any questions that you have. Um, I think um, it would be an exhaustive process probably to go through all of the data, um, uh, examples and um, that's there, but um, I'm happy to have Mike give you uh, or answer any questions that you might have. But let me pause and give you the opportunity, uh, Bridget or board members on how you might wanna proceed through this monitoring report, which is pretty pretty lengthy. Mike, did you wanna say something first? I yeah. did, I, I did actually just prepare sort of a, uh, a quick overview. I, I definitely will not read you the report and it's supporting documents that would take several board meetings, but, um, but I did sort of prepare some remarks to give you a snapshot and also to to inform the board of of the structure the supporting documents and kind of what you're looking at and i did also want to um provide some details around the inclusion of our continuity of learning plan that went to the agency so um if there's time on the agenda i'd appreciate you know just five ten minutes tops just to give uh, an overview I think that's great. We're we're a little ahead of schedule according to the agenda. So so take what you need in terms so, of time. So Mike, let me just start again. Um, it's sometimes assumed that people know whom who who we are. So uh, again, I think it's good to pause. Um, this is Mike Martin. He's our director of learning. He is uh, one of our district administrators. Um, he actually has an office right beside me. And again, um, one of his major roles is. Um, um, making sure our curriculum is, um, we have a curriculum and that um, we are adhering to the curriculum. So um, thanks Mike for being on. Thank you, Superintendent Young. The, um, the uh, yeah, I, I would just should probably start by saying that uh, I love my job, I love my boss and I love my job title too, um, which is the director of learning. Uh, I really like that job title because it's on the curriculum side, it's the learning for students. And of course, you can't have a, a vibrant, high quality curriculum without great professional learning. So that's the other part of my job. So learning for our staff and learning for our students. So mostly PD and, and curriculum is, is the focus of my work. So I'm pleased tonight to be um, sharing with you this um, curriculum review. It's a monitoring report 2.10. And um, so uh, the first thing I wanted to say is that um, uh, last year, I heard the board say that they appreciated the explicit sort of connecting to our board ends in, in this report. And so this, re this year's uh, edition is structured the same way. It's structured by how does our curriculum uh, function as a means to meeting those ends. Um, so that's the first thing. And I should also say that this is not, the focus of this report is not about student performance. It's about the curriculum that, um, that will allow our students to, to excel. Um, however, the review is, is based on information from student performance data, available learning opportunities, and of course, current best practice and research from the field. 
The report also, um, you have uh, supporting documents and uh, with parenthetical citations in the report, I referenced uh, last year's NIASC study at the high school and also last year's integrated field review, which was conducted uh, district-wide. Um, and I was looking through the PDFs and was unable to see the integrated field review included. That's something that you already have, but I'd be glad to uh, add that uh, if, if you, in fact you don't have that in your, your board packet. So because it's in, our, it's in our hard copy packet, like okay, we have it. Super. Yeah. I'd be glad to provide the um, the digital version as a follow up, even though I think you already have that as well. But because the integrated field review is on a three year cycle and EASC is on a five year cycle, those findings still have currency. And so I, I sort of, and they're definitely, we're still in the process of implementing those recommendations. So uh, that's why you see, um, you, you see me using them as source documents in this, this year's monitoring report as well. Um, the, um, this, this report was originally planned for the month of March. And as I understand it was, it was pushed back because of our eventful spring here. Um, one thing that I do wanna highlight is that the report mentions a K-5 literacy audit to review our literacy curriculum. And then also a grade eight through 11 math audit. Um, I think the, the board reviewed the, the proposals for both of those audits. Those have been postponed until the fall. So we, we had um, federal funds lined up to conduct those audits as part of our curriculum review process. Because of the COVID-19 crisis, those have been pushed back to the fall. We'll be, we won't have to redo the RFP, but we will have to reapply for federal funds to pay for those consultants. So I just wanted to share that piece of information. And then um, also the fact, as I mentioned, you have the continuity of learning plan that we submitted to the Agency of Education uh, as an attachment. And we thought that would be in light of the, where we're at these days, we thought that would be an important update for the board to have in their hands about um, really significant uh, shifts and a lot of hard work by our teachers, administrators, and really our whole staff in order to make this, this uh, shift to remote learning um, and with all the, the challenges that come with it. So, um, so I guess the, the only other thing that I would say is if I just go quickly through the, um, the ends, the things that I'd like to kind of um, direct your attention to is under disposition for lifelong learning. Um, our ongoing uh, professional development and professional learning around universal design for learning and trying to develop expert learners who are autonomous is, um, is remains a, a top priority for professional learning and also instructional shifts in the classroom. That's very much in line with um, developing lifelong learners and developing those dispositions. Our flexible pathways, uh, our programs for flexible pathways, and I'll come back to that with the um, ENDS uh, monitoring report at the, at the end of the year, but our flexible pathways structures are really strong, I think, in our district. Um, so I, I referenced those. And then also the fact that we have, um, really, we're assessing um, our student learning expectations, which is our, our set of transferable skills which we've mentioned, I've mentioned several times at earlier board uh, meetings, those 21st century skills really um, speak to developing, fostering lifelong learning dispositions. Under 1.2 academic proficiency, um, you know, as you know, this was to be the first year of graduating students based on proficiencies um, in light of the, you know, the current circumstances. Um, there's, we're, we're following closely the state guidance around uh, modifications with grading, reporting, um, attendance, um, and you'll see some of that referenced in the continuity of learning plan. Um, but I'm pleased to report that we do have that data. We're starting to collect that data for the first time to ensure um, that all of our students are meeting proficiency in the content area, you know, the math proficiencies, social studies, each content area, but also the, the transferable skills that are student learning expectations that I mentioned. The big uh, curriculum change or the biggest accomplishment, I should say, with curriculum um, this year 
probably was the work that, um, that we did with teachers at the middle school where we remapped the entire middle school curriculum so that every single course has shared uh, content proficiency indicators and student learning expectation indicators um, with teachers of the same course. So that's the first time in recent history where we have that uh, level of shared curriculum and also the fact that it's, um, it's, it's a proficiency based framework is, is uh, really huge. So that's a, that, was, that was really a, a huge endeavor. At the elementary level, uh, work continues, uh, ongoing work and some, some really uh, great leadership from our coaches to um, have ensure that we have a balanced math block. We're trying to work towards what's a balanced math block look like and what's a balanced literacy block look like with mini lessons and then differentiated um, opportunities for students to work. With our math coaches, this um, working with the All Learners Project, high leverage concepts, being really clear about what the non-negotiables are in math for each grade level, we see as a, a really significant curriculum review. Um, and as, a, as I mentioned, the, the literacy audit, we're disappointed uh, about that being delayed because we know that um, teachers draw on so many different literacy resources. We wanna sort of um, take stock of that, audit the, the various literacy strategies, resources being used, so that we can have a similar uh, consensus in our approach to literacy, um, which of course is not one skill. You're talking about reading, writing, handwriting. Um, and so we wanna have the, that same uh, clarity and consistency across classrooms and schools and literacy. So we're, we're disappointed that that's been delayed, but we're looking forward to, to re-engaging with that work in the fall. So a balanced math block and literacy block with high leverage concepts in math at the elementary school for academic proficiency at the middle school, really the, the heavy, uh, just remapping the entire curriculum in, in a little more than a year, uh, just incredible work by, by the entire middle school staff. A lot of help from our uh, Tarrant Institute associate to Life Ligeros, who's done a fantastic job of, of helping, working with Carson and Dave to, um, to structure professional learning time during faculty meetings, during, um, during TLC time as well. Um, and then, as I mentioned at the high school, really this was the first year where with um, our new uh, student management system where grades were maintained and proficiencies um, towards graduation, towards making a determination towards graduation. And I just wanna reiterate that um, you know, it is our position and this is in line with guidance from the state of Vermont that we're gonna hold harmless all students during this remote learning time. So the emphasis is definitely going to be on, um, on providing students feedback, on providing students support, and uh, making sure with everything going on and the various challenges our families are facing that we're not, uh, we're not dinging kids on incomplete work or uh, because they missed, uh, they weren't at morning meeting in a Zoom session. Really the idea is that we, we want to make sure that the focus is on learning and next steps for students and not, um, not dinging them on grades. So at the high school, for example, uh, there's a pass fail option. I think you heard Cole uh, speak to that at your last meeting. And the idea here, that, that flexibility in grading to accommodate to get, get students over the hump during this, uh, during this crisis is, um, is definitely the approach there. So, um, so that's, Having said that, that uh, proficiency structure remains in place, and I'll come back to sort of uh, how we're starting to, to collect that data longitudinally in the ENDS monitoring report at the end of the year. Um, for personal development, 1.3, uh, our PLPs, the fact that we have personalized learning plans through grades 6 through 12 is a, is a strength of our curriculum. The fact that we have advisory or mor morning meeting pre-K-12, I also think is a significant, um, is really a, a, a commitment that is clear and a, a universal practice in our district that we're really seeing the value of right now during uh, this time where we're feeling distanced from our students and worried about how they're doing. That, uh, those morning meetings, the fact that we have uh, some structures in place to convene advisories and morning meetings to reconnect with students 
has, uh, has really been a, an incredible resource during this challenging time. And then the last thing that I'll say is that those, those PLPs at the middle school are structured by the, um, the SLEs. <laughs> Sorry to use so many acronyms. So the personalized learning plans in grades 6, 12 are structured, all the students are structured by the transferable skills. Um, the student learning expectations, which is another strength when we think about personal development. Those are 6, uh, 612 that we we're really using those and um, and student led conferences is something that uh, again with Life Ligeros and the Tarrant Foundation, we've been doing some work on and I think we still have some work ahead at the middle school. Um, with the idea that, that students feel like they're the owners of their work and they're able to speak to that and uh, do some serious goal setting and reflect on, on where they're doing well and where they need to grow. Um, so those, there are some good structures around student-led conferences at the middle school that need additional uh, development and, um, and where they fall on the, the calendar and how they complement report cards and traditional parent-teacher conferences um, is still, uh, we still have more work ahead in that area. To finish, for citizenship, I'm really proud to work in a district that has such a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, by, unfortunately, our, we had, a, with Susie Merrick, we did a, a lot of work to have, um, this spring, actually, um, we were to have a two-day training on campus. And after that training, we would have had 150, a total of 150 of our staff having gone through this um, nationally accredited training from Courageous Conversations About Race Beyond Diversity One. Unfortunately, that was canceled because of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, but uh, we uh, some great work again, both some energy around the Black Lives Matter flag raising again, um, uh, leading up to that this year. But our the high school student diversity union and the um, and also at the middle school, students organize against racism, SOAR. Uh, both of them have been using the speak up protocol from Teaching Tolerance, uh, which is from the Southern Poverty Law Center, to work with peers and teachers to really stop microaggressions and to, to work on improving school climate. So that level of leadership from our students is something that um, I think we can all really be proud of. Um, and the other thing that I, I think is a recent victory in the area of citizenship that I'd like to highlight is, um, and you, you saw a presentation from this uh, with our ends in action, is the restorative practice circles that are starting to grow as a practice in um, our elementary schools, Wolfpack time specifically. And so it's my hope that we can make them a universal pre-K pre five practice, um, building on the good work that's been happening at Chamberlain. So you saw a presentation from uh, Holly and uh, some of her colleagues. And uh, so uh, the, the restorative practice circles with Wolfpack time, school-wide practice is something that uh, I hope that we can, um, we can scale up and use at all three schools. So thanks, sorry to go on for so long. Thank you very much for listening. And I'd be glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Mike. I think for me, before anything else, the first thing to say is kudos to Mike and to David and to everybody in the district for the continuity of learning that I've seen. Um, I've been impressed with how resources have gone out to students, how everybody has been included, how meals are getting out. Um, and I've talked to friends who are teachers in other districts and you know, we're privileged to have the ability to do this. You know, we start off at a better place perhaps, um, but the way that our district has done with this is definitely better than some of the other ones around. And, and again, we're lucky, but it's also been due to good leadership. Um, so thank you. Um, one question, I guess eventually I'll have a few, but just to start with one, um, this 1 1.4, the citizenship, um, I wondered if any sort of traditional notion of civics fits in there, or is that done more within like a history context? How does, how does that kind of idea fit in? That's a great question. I think, um, I think that's a great idea. We have um, the, the two things I think that we've done recently uh, along those lines, Brian, are uh, last year, as we were trying to grow implementation of the C3 standards at the elementary schools, we had a series during the TLC days 
the, um, the early release, late start, uh, embedded professional development days, we had a series on applying, um, looking at citizenship in the C3 standards. So that was the, the sole focus. And, um, you know, I think initially some teachers were, geez, you know, I, I'm a kindergarten teacher, you know, how do I teach citizenship? And um, as, as we dug into, you know, what does this look like at the different age levels? It was just an uh, incredible response. And uh, we had uh, just terrific work from a um, high school social studies teacher, Emily Gilmore, and from one of our coaches, Alicia Backman, who uh, teamed up to do that series. So I think that's an example of where we're trying to make that connection in the curriculum itself. The other thing that I can think of, and I think we need to come back at this, is some initial equity scans of our curriculum. So again, this is working with the equity committee and Susie Merrick and um, some teacher leaders looking at, um, during some district in-service work, where do we see, um, when, we, when we step into the classroom, when we're looking at class course materials, when do, where do we see, um, what, what messages are being sent about our democracy and what it means to be a citizen? And um, so I think that, uh, you know, our, our country right now is, is taking a hard look at some of our, our problematic history in this country when it comes to race in particular, um, gender as well, how we treated different groups of, of people, uh, immigration and how we think of immigration and whether or not we're a, po a country of immigration. And so these, these questions have huge implications for the, um, for the curriculum. So, uh, so I think we, we've done, we've kind of put a, a toe in there, but I think there's more work ahead to do um, a, a, a review, May, maybe an audit. Some, other, some of my colleagues in other districts are doing actual equity audits where the, uh, the whole curriculum is, is reviewed through that lens. Um, Those things do connect, and we do need in history classes, in you know, in our civics curricula, to make sure that that um, that that's in line with our values. And a lot, a lot of the work that we're seeing our student leaders and school leaders uh, doing. Um, did someone else have a question? I have a bunch, but I, I want to yeah, get everybody. I time. have a question, Bridget. Um, it, you know, when, uh, when Mike was talking about kind of flexible pathways, um, and, and I think about programs like our big picture program, uh, which really focuses on those learners that learn best through experiential um, work and, and things like that and self-design, um, we're starting to get information, I think, at, in, the, in the profession, but as well, the board is receiving uh, some information anecdotally, but basically of uh, folks sort of saying that they are, and this would be at maybe more the middle to high school level, benefiting from virtual learning. Um, so I, I, it really begs the question, you know, as we talk about proficiencies, where does, where do we think virtual learning is going to uh, kind of have a foothold in um, developing the competency and proficiency around lifelong learning, um, and you know how how will we start to link that new competency not only as a learner but also in prevent, uh, you know potentially becoming um, a new profession. And we always say that the jobs our kids may have don't even exist today <coughs> um, in the future. Um, so are we giving some thought to how we're going to link? Um, virtual learning and the competency of managing that learning to future proficiencies? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, I think that, um, I think most educators and uh, well, I'll just speak for Vermont, but I think if you talk to a lot of educators in Vermont, despite the significant challenges and sort of the humbling experience that it's been for all of us to try to uh, meet our students and family needs during this um, remote learning uh, period. I think that still uh, most of us would say that it's been, uh, there's been this explosion of professional learning and 
in, you know, kind of Yankee ingenuity and, and figuring things out. Um, and so that includes teachers who would never use Google Classroom, who all of a sudden at the elementary level, okay, I'm all in. I'm going to move my entire curriculum onto Google you know, Classroom. Um, having said that, I mean, it's not, <laughs> I, I, don't, I shouldn't uh, overstate it. You can't just, you know, you, as you can imagine, you don't just like push a button and put all your curriculum on Google Classroom overnight. But, um, and, and, you know, we've received clear guidance, both national and state guidance about making sure that we don't try to jam, you know, lots of direct instruction into our students' days, even as our families are struggling, like with serious economic and health challenges. So um, I don't, I don't want you to hear that it's a copy paste job because it really isn't. I do want to emphasize the fact that uh, teachers have just, our teachers, our coaches, our ITE folks, our you know tech integrationist folks have done just this incredible job of figuring out, so how do you do morning meeting through Zoom? And how do, how do I provide feedback uh, you know, electronically? And what types of activities do I really need to do? Because if I'm, if I'm just standing in Zoom and delivering a lecture, um, the student engagement piece really is probably not going to work out for me, <laughs> given all the other things going on. So how do I have to, um, excuse me, so how do I have to uh, modify the curriculum and adapt it to that? So I guess that's the first, the first thing I wanted to say is, Elizabeth, it's definitely, I think this has um, accelerated a lot of that change, just this experience this spring in thinking about, wow, how could we do that? And I, even at the same time that we're seeing the challenges of remote learning. The second thing that I would say is that um, at the state level, whether it's you know the Vermont PBS curriculum that they've made available online with tutorials, um, whether it's uh, Vermont um, VTVLC, uh, the Virtual Learning Consortium, um, VTVLC I think has just continued to get better over time. Uh, my anecdotally, as a parent, my son took one of a, a course there that was really poorly done in their and sharing some materials and the feedback that I've been hearing is that they've really become, they've really developed that in a way that they're not doing the copy paste online, like sort of a, a lame version of what you would have gotten in a traditional class. They're really figuring out you know, how do we do this online learning thing? And I think that's been in response to, um, in the early years, you know, students didn't complete those courses. The completion rate was not good overall. Um, and, um, and, and I think maybe this is in your question, Elizabeth, part of that is, you know, students have to have the wherewithal, the self-direction to be able to hang in there and to kind of manage their own learning. And so uh, anecdotally, I want to concur with you, anecdotally, we're hearing some students are actually thriving right now with that, that uh, flexibility that they're getting during this remote learning period, that they can decide when they're going to engage with the lesson, um, because we've really been emphasizing asynchronous delivery over you know, scheduled regular class time, but all moved online. And, um, and also for students who struggle with some you know, social dynamics, they're finding that, you know, I'm, I can um, settle right into this lesson. I can get support from my teacher. I can, um, who emails me back or does a, a quick Zoom check-in. And um, so, yeah, I, I'm hearing that too, that for some students, they're finding this uh, very rewarding. So I, I, I think, uh, first of all, I want to say that this, this crisis has been an accelerant for change, I think, in a good way for, for professional learning. Um, and uh, at the same time that we realize that remote learning, uh, you know, online learning is not gonna replace our vibrant, um, caring, in-person learning communities. We have a, a really strong in-person learning community. And so I don't, I don't see that going away, but expanding options is what I'm hearing you say to uh, speak to. And also the idea that, um, you know, students learn in different ways which is very much in line with universal design for learning. So how, how rich is that palette that we're providing of offerings? And, uh, and I'm hopeful both as a flexible pathway, like, oh, I wanna 
you know, I decided I want to take this course online instead of doing a traditional classroom. But it would be my hope also that we're infusing some of what we're learning back into quote unquote traditional classes in the fall as well. So sorry, that was a long answer. Great question. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just want to thank you, Mike, um, and I want to make sure board members have other questions that we get them answered. But I mean, I, th I do think that the current state that we're in right now um, with the COVID-19 issue, and again, all of what Mike has talked about around uh, the, the positivity that we're hearing, again, through the hard work that the teachers are doing, is predicated, importantly, on the solid relationships that, and trust that our students have with our teachers. Right, so it's important to understand how we got there. It is because of the care and the trust and the relationships that have been built up um, that, that I believe has allowed us to be successful. For instance, in those morning meetings, <clears throat> the classroom teacher and staff can see uh, a little bit of the demeanor of the students is important. Why? Because they've come to know them and have relationships and trust with those with students and and it goes back and forth. The other part, again, Mike hit on it again, is what have we learned out of this? And I think it's on point to what Elizabeth is asking is, when you look at uh, universal de design for learning, uh, particularly like representation, you know, I think it speaks to uh, understanding the importance of the diversity in which our students learn. And so it may be that it's an opportunity for uh, reteaching or recognizing that the different modalities that students learn often um, in a quieter environment sometimes uh, being able to listen to the lecture uh, is really helpful or listen to it again is really helpful. Um, so again, I think there's some, as Mike said, there's a lot of lessons learned. Um, every, everything that happens, you know, happens for a reason and can allow us to grow and build upon uh, on some of those situations. And again, Mike points out the, you know, the Google Classroom is an example and boy, what a great job teachers have, have done to, to respond to that. So again, thanks. Um, I, I don't wanna hog the time, but I, I was wondering if I could jump in with a sort of a mental health advising question. Um, both the integrated field report and the NEASC refer to, um, in the integrated field report, uh, parents indicate a need for increasing mental health supports in the district. And in the NEASC, um, the South Burlington High School Counseling Department is finding it no longer has an adequate staff able to serve the uh, And all of this was pre-COVID, of course. Um, so I guess the questions are, well, they're pretty obvious, but one is what does that look like in this time of distance learning? Two is what's gonna happen when we go back to some version of normal, um, possibly under an austerity budget without a whole lot of resources. Um, and to the degree that it's useful and welcome, uh, I was wondering if either Cole or Delaney uh, wanted to weigh in, you know, either in terms of just what distance learning looks like or Delaney specifically with her interest in, in mental health. I'd be glad to, to have the, the student reps talk, speak to that first. Delaney or Cole, did you want to weigh in? Um, sure. So I guess with all of the classes, they've been setting up what the agenda is for the week on Sunday, or they'll send it out by Monday at the very latest. Um, and that gives us a very good grasp of what do we have for this week? How are we best to manage it? Um, and just kind of setting up our task list for the week. Um, something that has been nice, a lot of teachers have started to add time frames for how long assignments should be taking. Um, so for example, I'll get a chem my chemistry um, assignment for the week. We'll say this assignment should take 10 to 30 minutes. This assignment should take five to 20 minutes. Um, and that's helping us know if we're really not getting it and something that said that it should take no more than 20 minutes is taking 40 minutes. That's one of our signs to go ask the teacher for more help. Um, and so that's been really helpful. Then in terms of like access to guidance counselors, I guess that was kind of what I was hearing as a question. Um, they've been really helpful. I know I had a little bit of anxiety around assignments because everything was kind of 
they're a lot better now. They found a good method, but towards the beginning, people were still trying to figure things out. Um, and so I was able to reach out to my guidance counselor and we were able to have um, a Zoom meeting one-on-one -on -one, and that was really helpful. And so they've been really good about reaching out typically on the weekly basis, sending out a guidance department newsletter. Um, and that's been nice to see as well. I think we're still trying to figure things out. It's definitely gotten a lot better. Um, obviously there's no way of being 100% comfortable with it because no one signed up to be on online high school, but um, it's starting to get there. and We're starting to find that normalcy. Yeah, I would uh, agree with Cole. Um, what's also been really nice too is a couple of my teachers have had like, or well, all of my teachers have had FaceTime where you can go on Friday. So that's been really, really helpful for me at least. And um, all the teachers have been really, really flexible and um, and to the guidance counselors as well. Um, I was supposed to have a meeting with Chuck at, on Monday and I couldn't make it and he was super flexible. He was like, okay, let's do this time. Like they're being, they're being all super accepting right now and really flexible. Well, in Colin Delaney, I guess this is sort of a weird question, but has it in any way been superior? You know what I mean? To, to, to what happened a couple of months ago or before? Uh, do you mean in the sense of um, the teachers like with in, well uh, yeah in terms of clarity or in terms of access to counselors or you know what i mean like has anything been better <laughs> it seldom like happens now but like in comparison to when we were in person learning correct um i feel like we've all become more proficient in online technologies so like finding ways of using um zoom and finding ways of using documents to enhance our class. Um, and so in that form, we've improved. In the communication form, I'd say we haven't. Um, and not in the teacher's way, but like in group conversation, we haven't been, that hasn't been a strong suit. Um, for example, I haven't met with one of my classes since the first week of online learning, just because of the way that that class is being run right now. Um, and so that's been a little difficult but that's just been my personal experience. Yeah, so <clears throat> Brian, if I could, I think that um, here's some great examples about the importance of, um, and this is something that's recommended for trauma-informed practice. Um, it's a universal strategy. Trauma background, the, the importance of predictability, right? And so we know from the research that students coming from a trauma background need to know what's happening in an hour, what's happening in five minutes, what's happening in two minutes from now to, to get uh, sit, to be situated, to, to have a, a feeling of security. And, um, and um, so, and, but we know that's just good practice for everybody. And so I appreciated Cole kind of pointing that out, the importance of predictability. Now that we're on more of this, um, a weekly cycle, as opposed to a day by day cycle, with continuity of learning. And we're really striving, I think Delaney really spoke eloquently to this, the importance of flexibility and letting students know that we're there for them and we know stuff happens. And, and our primary mission is to get them over the hump, to help them you know, find, find ways forward. I also heard Cole this, mention the timeframes thing as a way to, to check in. We know that <clears throat> everybody works differently and people have different learning styles, but um, this idea that something as simple as saying, you know, this should probably take you 15, 20 minutes. And if you're getting bogged down, then please reconnect. And this, this idea, Delaney mentioned, you know, FaceTime office hours, right? The importance of uh, some kind of check-in um, that, that works for students. So um, I, don't, I, I, I don't think most people would say that, um, and you know, I defer to Delaney and Cole, but uh, I'd be surprised to hear people s refer to this as like a superior experience, but I think there are silver linings it's, which is maybe what you're you're pointing out, Brian, and um, and like like, a, like I said in response to Elizabeth's question, <clears throat> I hope that we can carry some of these lessons forward and make them not a teacher preference thing, but really say, okay, this is this is what we learned as a as an organization and how we'd like to um, to do business. What you know, 
what did we learn during the crisis that that um that really works moving forward? That's what I hear you speaking to. Mike, can I ask a question? Um, this is a question that has a few different examples, I guess, in it. I guess the, the overall question is how is feedback from parents and families factoring into the curriculum, at, if at all? So, um, you know, I sit in these meetings and, and everything sounds great and we're doing so much work and we're, we're getting ourselves aligned with standards and all of that. But then I consistently hear from not a large group of parents, but there I consistently hear from a decent number of parents. Um, either my kid is falling through the cracks; they are not getting what they need in terms of literacy and math, for example. Or um, I've I've talked to several people, you know, while I was out in the community talking about master planning and visioning, saying, you know, South Burlington High School just wasn't working for my child, and the tech center is a much better fit, and they're thriving there in a way that they weren't at South Burlington. Um, I've heard from people who have said, you know, my child was just in love with math until they kind of got to high school and they hit the high school math curriculum where it's all integrated and, and all that and, and then struggled. Um, I've heard concerns about PBGRs and sort of the inconsistent application of them. And it sounds like a lot of the work that's been going on at the middle school in particular has been trying to address that one in particular. But I guess my, my overall question is really, what is the mechanism to make sure that we're hearing from families about whether their kids are getting what they need or not need, uh, or, or what, getting what they need at both ends of the spectrum. So I've definitely heard from parents who feel like kids are not up to, to grade level or where they'd like them to be. And then I've also heard from parents at the other end of the spectrum saying, my kid could be doing so much more and they're spending their time kind of focused on, on you know, this sort of middle level of instruction and they're, they're sort of disengaging because they're, they're just not being challenged. Um, and so I guess my question is, where's the mechanism for feedback? So it's a very long-winded question. And then I'll just drop the other one too, which is have we thought about one thing that I'm finding, and this is more as a parent, is that um, having my children at home and seeing what they're working on a little bit has been really helpful for me. And I feel like that was really missing because of our no homework policy. And I think it, it really has been eye-opening for me to see, you know, overall, for example, one of my children doing, you know, getting great reports and great, you know, teacher feedback but then noticing some real specific gaps because we're at home like doing that work with them day after day after day. And I guess my question is whether we've thought about revisiting any of that, um, not necessarily in light of the COVID crisis, but just where we are in that because that was meant to be sort of a pilot to see how it was going. And then we've kind of just adopted it really as a district and whether there's any been any sort of follow-up on revisiting that, that no homework policy. So sorry if it was very, I'll let you answer. Great. No. Uh, well, the first, the my shortest answer will probably be for the the first part, which is just what's the parent feedback mechanism that we're we're thinking about right now, and that's timely because this morning <laughs> I was working with some principals on just that. So, uh, you as you may already know, districts are putting out different surveys, um, and so. We'll definitely be doing one. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that um, David, that we can, um, with David, be working on this as a full pre-K-12 admin team next week to finalize a single survey that's um, pre-K-12, that's not 37 questions, that's really kind of what we care about um, and, and also leaves, you know, has some prompts and some, you know, probably like a Likert scale type response with you know very much where people can say um how pleased or how concerned they are with various prompts but then open-ended just for parents to be able to say anything that's on their minds so that we can be grabbing that information as a district across schools with the same questions um in the meantime teachers have been kind of doing their own surveys and so that's that's good you know they've been doing um uh, sort of just quick check-ins in simple uh, surveys. Some some teachers have with with some parents, and I think the probably the caution is we don't want to survey people out, right? We don't. We did this uh, family support survey, which went out through school messenger, you know, with repeated callbacks until we got a reply. We made that available online, 
then teachers are doing some surveys. Schools may do a survey. Um, I mentioned this district survey to talk, that's really about how's continuity of learning going for you and your family and your student. Um, and I think it, we need to see then, does it make sense to repeat that at the end of June to do you know, two, two sort of check-ins, kind of halfway point and at the end to see, see where we are. I think there could be value in that. Um, but uh, I, think, I think we're trying to temper that with um, not surveying people out. So that's, that's that. And then um, you, you mentioned um, several like really, um, you know, just valid concerns about, you know, my student, I heard you say, you know, my student is at the tech center because the high school just didn't, didn't really work for them. And now my student is thriving. I would just say, great. You know, that's exactly what we're going for. Our tech centers are our partners. And, you know, if you find your path through big picture, fantastic. If you find it at the high school taking only AP classes, fantastic. If you find it at the tech center, or if you find some combination of all of those, so that it's truly flex flexible pathways and not multiple pathways, um, fantastic. So, um, so I, I think that that's, um, that's I, I see that as a strength. I'm sorry to hear about that, that child's experience, but I see that as, uh, as a viable option. Um, and I think that we're fortunate to have some, some tech centers that really, you know, it's not just wood shop anymore, right? We're talking about, you know, uh, CAD, we're talking about um, 3D printing, we're talking about um, just some great stuff going on. The math curriculum, I, I, I know, gets a lot of attention. And um, so I worked, the, the, the math audit that I mentioned was, um, was a great pretext for me to, it led to me having a, some really good conversations with Pat Burke and John Painter, as well as our middle school colleagues around math. And um, I know that, you know, like many districts, that transition to high school and, you know, eighth grade algebra and the, you know, is where's my student uh, in the, the math, you know, sequence. And then, um, so it's been, I guess, it was before my time, but um, it's been a couple of years that we've had this integrated math curriculum at the high school now. And um, so we're hearing different things. And so it's just perfect timing. And that's why that math audit was designed eight through 11. You know, 12th grade students taking math probably have already figured out, you know, what, you know, that they, they want to do calculus or, or trig or, or take a break from math uh, at that point because they feel they've done enough. Um, it really, it's those, those critical years, eight through 11 is where the bulk of our, that, that type of, those questions are coming up. And um, like I said, my, my, my middle school colleagues have been asking about those transitions in math plus in eighth grade. So, um, so I'm really, we have somebody who's nationally recognized to, on the, it's, it's a bummer that we had to cancel, but I'm hoping he will be able to come back in the fall to conduct that that audit so that we can get some questions and I'll definitely share that back to the board. And I think that's, um, that's, that's a great discussion with proficiencies. Uh, I share that concern, you know, and, um, and so that's why, um, you know, at the middle school, we really leaned into one thing that comes up, Bridget is, um, when there's not a clear hierarchy of standards, so you could have like three proficiencies in this course and 27 in this course. That's problematic um, because of the amount of time spent on each one, because of the grain size of each one. And so some of the work, I think that's some of the work ahead at the high school. I think they're, they're on the right path and they're, they're doing that. And that's why at the middle school, the curriculum maps that I'll share, um, um, either by the end of this year, I think that, that um, we'll have them published and I'll, I'll send them to the, to the board. Uh, but the, the middle school proficiency-based curriculum mapping that we did this year, um, there's the same number of content proficiency indicators and the same number for a given course. Um, and so the, the point there is that underneath them, there are supporting learning targets. So there's this sort of idea of, you know, um, it's not just like you use a year long standard, here's a learning target that's a week long. It can easily become a jumble when we're not really paying attention to that. So I'm, I'm feeling really good about the consistency question uh, as we move into that new curriculum next year at the middle school. And I'm, I'm glad that we're, we're continuing to work on that. And um, I appreciated your, your kind words about saying, you know, 
I come to the, I'm part of these board discussions and it's really exciting to think about the, the work that we're hearing about um, and we see these great presentations and then you know I hear concerns and I, I just want to humbly acknowledge that um, I'm really proud to work in the district and I'm, um, I feel grateful to, to work with the people that I work with and I really don't think that the work is done. Pretty much every single thing that I'm, I'm sharing with you tonight, uh, there's always the next level of, of trying to get there. So that's how I tend to think about the work. The last thing you mentioned, the continuity of learning plans and how, how great it was as a parent to be able to see, see what's coming up, to see the scope and sequence, I guess, on a weekly rhythm. And uh, it made you wonder about the no homework policy. Um, and so, you know, maybe that's something that uh, a subcommittee that the board create could create down the road. I know that uh, in some districts, that's something that's happened where we bring people together. We have a facilitator. We talk about about that. I do know there's a there's a lot of it seems to me the research that I'm familiar with is definitely trending more towards, you know, uh, towards the no homework or homework restrictions at the early years. Um, than, than the other way uh, is the sort of the national trend that I'm seeing, um, but um, but maybe that's that's an idea down down the road. The other kind of thing that you made me think of when you brought that up is, you know, what what I thought you were going to say before the no homework thing is, you know, is there value in having a sort of curriculum at a glance? This is what we're working on this month. This is what we're working on this this week. Um, and I think some teachers do a lot of that in their newsletter. No, we do. We do that. I, more. My my question was more about. Um, and and uh, we get that um, at, at the elementary level, at least at Rick Marcotte, uh, and at least the teachers that my or that my boys have had. Um, we definitely see sort of what's coming or what we did this past week. You know, so that we and they encourage us to talk to our students about it. It was more on the the idea that. It's, it's hard for us as parents to really know how kids are doing or absorbing or not absorbing at that level if we're not sort of honestly forced into sitting down with them and doing some of the work and seeing where there are gaps. And that question has arisen, somebody actually jogged my memory that someone had brought this up with me as well, that um, if this, unfortunately, if this COVID-19 thing is something that we're gonna see, you know, a recurrence of or there are other, times where we need to be prepared for kids to learn at a distance. Um, a lot of parents, and it's not just our house, this is our house, but other parents too that I've talked to are finding it challenging to get younger kids to really focus because home is where we play. You know, there is no sort of regular homework practice at home at all, um, other than reading, which, you know, in a lot of homes, that's sort of what we do as recreation, or that's what we do with our kids to connect with them. And so that transition, especially at the really young years to being expected to work at home and actually try to keep up at home with, with some even minor level of academic work is really challenging because those mindsets are just not there that this is a place where I do work. This is where I go to relax. This is where I go to misbehave. This is where I go to you know play um, and school is where I do my work. And I, I, I'm, fully aware of the, the research about, you know, homework not necessarily being helpful um, and, and getting in the way of family time and other things that kids may do. And that's, I think, as a board the no homework policy at its outset, I guess my question is sort of twofold, you know, have we reviewed that and, and thought about how it's actually playing out in our district? You know, are we hearing from middle school teachers that kids are better prepared or any less prepared or, you know, what is, how are they feeling on that transition from fifth grade to sixth grade. And then also as we think about the future and what this crisis is teaching us about what we might need to be prepared for in the future, is that something that we um, need to start thinking about in terms of just making sure that there is a mechanism for kids to sort of get used to learning at a distance off and on if that's what ends up, I, God forbid it happened, but if, if that's what ends up happening in the future. Um, and that brought up another question for me, which, um, which this is a monitoring report about our overall curriculum development, but again, it's hard to keep COVID-19 out of it, mm -hmm. is what we're thinking about doing in the fall or whenever we're back um, to close the gap that will have inevitably opened up between kids with a lot of resources at home and a lot of parent time at home um, and um, the ability to really keep up and in some ways jump ahead 
um, on certain things where they might fall behind on other things. I feel like you know each individual child is going to be all over the map when they get back. Um, so maybe really far ahead in math, for example, and really far behind in writing, or vice versa. And then between kids, you know, and some kids who you know left the last few months of whatever grade and learning kind of stopped there. Um, and then they have a five or six month gap really versus students who were able to really have the support to keep up because I, and one of the, it's a meme, but one of the, the quotes that sort of sticks with me is that if we're grading right now, we're really grading, you know, privilege, we're grading, you know, economic uh, and, and, and other types of privilege because it's those kids that, that have that, um, that will find themselves not really having as big a gap. And so what are we thinking about in terms of how to address that in the fall. Thank you. That's a great thing, question to bring up. And um, I think that's something that everybody's, everybody's asking right now. So yeah. another really timely question. Um, you know, uh, David will probably want to piggyback on my remarks, but this Friday, we're looking forward to some, um, some new guidance coming out about end of year activities, but also summer activities. Um, there's some people are hoping for more direction, but um, my colleague Holly Ruel was at, a, I think it was a VPA board meeting that Secretary French attended. And she shared with us a comment that he said that probably we'll see in guidance soon um, to, to that group. And it was, he said uh, pretty, pretty directly, really clearly, um, summer is not the time for remediation. Summer is the time to prepare for eventual you know, uh, remote learn to get much, much better at remote learning. And I think, um, you know, uh, districts that, uh, you know, we, we have geographical advantages. Uh, we have, you know, resources in a committed com uh, community that really supports education. And so we're fortunate for that in South Burlington, but in other parts of Vermont, there are just, there's, there's not cable under the ground to get internet connections or there's really, really poor cell phone coverage. So, um, our challenges kind of dwarf when we compare to those. So I'm sure he had had some of those places in mind, but I, I also, um, and I think uh, Superintendent Young and, and my colleagues feel the same way. I think that, um, that we, we can get better at this, even though it doesn't replace in-person learning. So, um, so basically this Friday, we're looking forward to some guidance. We'd like to see what we have summer school, for example, on hold right now. If, you know, uh, in-person graduation is canceled, then it's kind of tone deaf. It doesn't make a lot of sense to bring, you know, 300 um, young people back a couple of days later to kick off summer school. So that's something that we're really, we're doing a lot of work behind the scenes to try to figure that out. We also have this childcare mandate. So I was on a meeting today with Lee Lampier and Joanne Godek as we were thinking about extended school year for students with special needs or students on IEPs, I should say. And, um, and, uh, and then Lee's, all of Lee's incredible work to provide childcare as mandated by the state. And so, you know, there's, depending on the social distancing guidelines that we get from the state, we may or may not even have physical room in the schools without even talking about trying to hire staff for summer school in June. Um, so I guess uh, to be continued, but right now it appears to be shaping up and the, the, me the messages we're getting is take the summer to further refine some of the things we've been talking for the fall if there is an event, a second wave so that we, we don't have students slipping through the cracks. We don't have students um, you know, getting getting lost in the shuffle or losing track of students. And uh, as I mentioned, we're we're working really hard. Our school our school based clinicians, our guidance counselors, our principals are on the phone daily, reaching out, calling, checking in with parents every time a student's not at morning meeting, or every time we've noticed through Google Classroom the student has missed a couple of days' lessons. So we're really uh, committed to that. And uh, I'm proud of the work my colleagues are, are doing on that front and we're, we're all working together on that. But, um, but we still feel like it's not enough. So I think that's, um, I, th I think that we're going to be thinking more in terms of not trying to just catch everybody up this summer or catch everybody up in September, October, because maybe that's not even possible, but in instead be thinking about, um, 
uh, and you know, I heard Brian speak to this too, thinking about where kids will be at socially and from a mental health wellness standpoint. I, I, it, for me personally, it brings me back to universal design for learning, which thinks about the, the social emotional dimension first, because if students aren't, uh, aren't well there, they're not ready to learn. So I think that uh, from a universal standpoint, we need to be doing a lot more of the types of things we've been talking about tonight in a systematic way, not a this teacher likes it kind of way or this, this team is doing it and this team is not doing it yet kind of way. So, um, so sorry, so that's, that's, a, uh, that's a lot of, I think there are a lot of unknowns, but I think that that's the way it's shaping up right now is to not try to jam uh, remediation into this summer in light of ongoing health concerns um, and instead to really be thinking uh, to trying to build robust systems that are flexible enough to accommodate a second wave in the fall should that occur. Yeah Mike I, again thanks um, great great um, questions from the board great uh, responses. Um, I, I do think that um, as you point out um, looking at direct from the governor and the secretary on a moving forward basis, um, you know, we're kind of preparing for these various learning options, whether it's, we hope, knock on wood, semi back to normal. If not, what will that look like? Will, or will we be in a reduced capacity in our schools? Um, will we be further reduced? I don't know, or in the similar model that we're in now. I don't know. But what, one thing I do know is that the staff that we currently have planned in this particular proposed budget is going to play a critical role uh, to serving the population. Um, whether we're in any one of those options, it's going to be really, really critical. And, um, you know, we've heard highlights of our social workers, guidance counselors, and classroom teachers. You know, we've made some reductions to get to where we are now, the 2021. But with the unknowns right now, um, again, it, we're going to need all that horsepower um, available to to support our students as as they return. So um, anyway, Grace, does any Bridget, other? Can, yeah, can I yes. just more questions? I, yeah. I just want to um, kind of summarize some of that conversation because um, I think if it, all, all good information, but I also think at the crux of the original question that was asked is is really um, how do we review current practices under our policy, uh, under our policy governance? And, you know, when, when, when does that happen such that, you know, practices uh, that um, maybe don't support the policies are reviewed and, and uh, reconsidered? So I look, at, I look at one sort of review of current practices under policy, one is, What's the contribution to accelerating uh, the review of or actually reviewing current practices um, it, as it relates to the current COVID crisis? And then lastly, sort of what's the process to identify and close learning gaps um, when we are preparing for several pathways going forward? And that also is, it requires a review of some of the current practices. So I think this can apply to a number of different um, programs or procedures or practices within the district. Um, I think a couple of them have brought up, notably the homework um, practice or policy right now, but um, I, I really think that's, that methodology should be applied a, a little bit more broadly too. So I'll stop there, but that's kind of my takeaway from this dialogue. Martin or Alex, did you have any uh, questions or, or comments? Uh, I think uh, my questions actually will come out more when we see the ENDS monitoring report. I did have a couple of questions, but then realized that's really what they involve. Uh, I thought overall, I thought this was a good report uh, and, I, and I'm and i certainly ready to, to vote on it if we're going to uh, approve this as the next step. And Alex, where, what about you? Yeah, I'm, I'm ready to, to vote as well. Um, I like everything I've read. Um, I think it's, you know, obviously COVID-19 is a big disappointment and it's, it's hurting and, and, and in our household, you know, learning has slowed down, no question about that. But, uh, but anyhow, I do approve this. Thank you. Okay. 
Uh, shall we take action then? Okay. Um, so we are um, taking action on executive limitations monitoring report uh, 2.10 curriculum development and review. The superintendent shall not allow the district to be without written curricula aligned with Vermont standards and district ends policies that are coordinated across all grade levels and schools. Further, the superintendent shall not fail to review the curricula periodically based upon student performance results, learning opportunities data, new research and updated content knowledge with the goal of all students meeting the district's ends policy. Reasonable interpretation? Yes. Elizabeth, can you yes. unmute? Elizabeth, can you unmute just so we can hear you? Yes. There we go. Okay. So reasonable interpretation? Yes. 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 Adequate, adequate data? So yes. if, I yes. would say yes, but but I will say yes only to the extent that we understand the, the couple of uh, uh, amendments, I would say, or clarifications as far as the postponement. There are a couple of things that are being postponed that uh, is not reflected in the language, but recognizing those two postponements, yes. In compliance? Yes. 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 Uh, compliant, uh, and, and that, that does it. Uh, we don't need a compliance plan for in compliance. Okay. Thank you all for that. I should have checked just to triple check that there are no questions, but generally Steve's pretty good about alerting me if there are. Sorry about that, everyone, but there were no questions uh, from the public. Um, so we'll move on to item number 10, negotiations update. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, very much. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Good, good job, night. Mike. Thank you. Good night. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll report out on the SBEA, um, Bridget, um, that uh, both parties have agreed to an in-person meeting on May 25th. Um, the board has also proposed a meeting, a virtual meeting prior to that date and um, two meetings following, all of which would be subject to um, you know, loosening restrictions on, um, on meeting uh, and social distancing. Uh, but all of uh, three of which would be, uh, one would be virtual for certain, and uh, the three others would uh, um, would be either in person or virtual um, if there's agreement on those. But there is at least one date that there is agreement to meet. Martin, did you want to give a little update on the other two? Yes, uh, for the uh, administrators, the SBAA, we've had... Uh, couple meetings, two meetings over the last couple weeks. Um, and uh, we'll probably be meeting again if necessary very, very soon. Things are moving along with that. Uh, nothing's really happening yet on the, the staff uh, uh, at this point. I just want to take just a couple of seconds. There have just been some questions circulating in the community um, about where we are in general in negotiations. Um, and what the process is. I just want to get clear that it's the board's responsibility um, to negotiate contracts with all three of our bargaining units. Um, all three bargaining units have contracts that expire on June 30 of this year. Um, so we had been working toward uh, meetings and setting up uh, plans and, and with the SBEA, the teachers union, we had met a few times uh, prior to the COVID-19 crisis. So we are working right now with all three units um, with regard to a contract for this upcoming school year um, and or potentially beyond. Um, and I just wanted to, to make that clear. Anything else to add anyone on negotiations updates? Uh, Bridget, if I could add, there was some discussion about the, um, just to also just for the sake of clarity, um, the statewide health care award is scheduled to go into effect 21. Um, and uh, there was some discussion about uh, the potential delay of that by a year. I just want to be clear that a delay of that um, uh, would um, financially improve the um, district's current um, budget uh, proposal. Um, in that there would be savings generated, but right now it does not look like there is a delay that is being discussed or incorporated into any legislative action at this point. Thank you, Elizabeth. 
Okay, seeing no questions or hands raised from the public, um, we will move on to item number 11, other paper articles discussion. And I must confess that I forgot to send uh, notes to Delina about our discussion last week. So I apologize for that. So the one that is in our packet uh, was the previous version and that is my fault entirely. Um, so Delaney, I'm assuming the mental health article went in. It looked great. And I know you got a little bit of feedback um, on that before it went in, um, but I'm assuming that one will be in tomorrow's other paper. Is that correct? Yes, I, I submitted it last week, yes. Excellent. Um, and then I know that we had moved Martin's legislative update um, to uh, probably August because it um, because the legislature will be meeting again in August uh, to sort of finalize the session then. Or September. Or September. <laughs> the budget information also, Bridget, will be in tomorrow. So we did get a, a rush to do that. So um, I just wanted, I, I wasn't clear when I, when I indicated that. It will run tomorrow. Oh, it will. Okay. Yes. Excellent. Um, and then um, we had discussed having um, a, an article about the outcome of the budget vote as well um, after May 28th. So that would have to be in the um, that would have to be in the July issue. That, or the, the no, that could be the June. It would be June. June. Right? The June. Sorry. Yeah. Well, what I mean by the July issue is that the question, if if the deadline is the twenty eighth and our vote is on the twenty eighth of May, I'm of just saying May. we'll get it in. We'll get it into the June, one of the June. Uh, well, but if our debt, well, I guess we could negotiate with the other paper to change whichever day. Mm -hmm. is our deadline, but the 28th is the deadline. If we don't know until very late on the night of the 28th what the outcome of the vote is, then it would not be able to run in the June 4th issue. It would have to be submitted in June and then run in the July issue unless we negotiate with the other paper to change the date of our board column. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, we can ask. We, yeah, could we ask about getting a couple of days delay on that, David? Even. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we'll try that one as the budget one, um, hoping that they can give us a couple days delay to have that written. Yeah, and I think okay. Maddie Clark is from the other paper. I think she's been on, so she's hearing us as well. I'll follow up with them. Okay. Um, um, Bridget, yes. um, I think Delaney and Cole have worked on an article on um, online learning or virtual learning. Yeah, I um, have that in my notes as well. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. And I, I, we may, that may be one that we have to purchase space for or could try to negotiate with the other paper, but um, that may be out of sequence with a normal board update. Um, so I would just offer that as a um, you know what the what's the board's pleasure around getting that in there from a timely standpoint i, I would not want to spend money on it. it you know if the other paper wants to publish it as as normal great but I, I don't think we should pay to put another one in we'll just have to i think we should just wait our turn Yeah, the question, Alex, is whether uh, we we have so much to talk about that it might make sense to do that um, yeah. before it's completely out of context. Because we um, we had talked as well about having an article about plans for the fall and and what things might look like or what were our expectations for what learning might look like in the fall, mm -hmm. and so. In my mind, we would hopefully start to have some clarity about that 
by the June 28th deadline. Um, mm -hmm. and, and perhaps that would run in July. At the very latest, that one would have to be the one to be written by around July 28th so that it could be in the early August issue. Um, and so, yeah, so I think we had said that um, I had the, I did had not done a good job with the dates. I had written down ideas, but not good dates. But so I think we had said perhaps Martin would be um, published in September, that August would be um, early August at the latest would be the plans for the fall, but that could be July as well. Mm -hmm. um, David, uh, Bridget, yeah. sorry. It might be worth having um, David at check at the same time we're looking for an extension on the May 28th submission to just indicate we have a student drafted article um, that's, you know, it's, it'll be in the 750 word range, I think, um, that really speaks to this, you know, a junior and senior's experience with virtual learning um, that I, I think it's a great precursor to whatever the startup plans are going to be for the district because um, it's kind of a capstone of what a lot of students year end experience will have been. Um, so I wonder if we just shouldn't be talking to the other paper about how to get that information out. Yeah, and it could be that they need, you know, articles, given that a lot of the stuff that is in there is often about, you know, school things, school mm -hmm. wrap up and sports and all the things that are currently not happening. So it could be um, that they that they would welcome that content. So if you wouldn't mind, David, that would be great. Yep, we'll work on it. I know, again, Deline is on taking notes and um, also um, and Maddie's on too. So we'll, we'll, we'll queue that up and have right, a, it. Could, it could be published as part of the, I mean, they, the no, coverage right. of schools as opposed to school board. I mean, so mm -hmm. uh, I would yeah. think that they'd welcome that. Yeah. Okay. So that would mean budget would hopefully run in the June 4th issue. Um, and then for the early July issue could be plans for fall if we feel like we know enough by then to publish that article by then. Um, or we kind of have an open space on that one uh, for the moment. Um, and, and then August would either be the open space for now or the plans for fall article. And then September would be Martin's legislative update. Were there any that I missed in my notes from last time? Uh, did you cover the ed fund update? I did not. That was one we had talked about as well. So, I mean, I guess that one um, could be the other one that sort of fills in the blank. The question is, um, will we know before August, or I mean, will we know by the end of June, for example, um, what that ed fund, you know, um, how to address the, how they're planning to address the ed fund and what that will mean for us? Will we know that yeah, by my the end of is, June? Yeah, my sense is we wouldn't know it in that time frame. It would be more a, more a September type time frame. Maybe even October. Okay. Okay. Well, should we leave it at that for now and then discuss again next meeting? Okay. Sure. All right, so just so Delina, so that you can get it. So just to be clear, so that was budget uh, due. Um, Hopefully David can get us an extension of a couple of days, maybe on May 30th or so um, after the outcome of our budget vote on the 28th. Um, and then either in July or August, the plans for fall and the reopening of school. Um, and then September would be Martin's legislative update. October potentially could be the Ed Fund or perhaps Martin's legislative update does focus on the Ed Fund, that could be as well. Right. Um, and then we, we do have one blank space in the middle. And then David was also going to talk to the other paper about potentially um, publishing Delaney and Cole's article about online learning. Um, so then that brings us to um, agenda item number 12, set the agenda for the May 20th meeting. So, um, 
I think that, you know, we've got to, we got to, this is the public um, information session that we need to do leading up to the, the vote. So we've devoted probably more time. I don't, you know, we've got a little more than a, a close to an hour, I guess, um, minus the city school collaboration update, but um, that's on there is, is kind of the, the key focus. Um, not sure what we'll have for uh, participation, but, or questions. Uh, that may be a fairly light agenda items. Um, my plan right now is to work in some of the other items uh, from the back side of that agenda, the future agenda items, and try to uh, provide some clarity, uh, some responses to those in kind of our similar Q&A format. We've done, uh, we can, um, I know um, some of you like to cross things off, the social media policy review, um, you could take that one off now because you did in fact, review that and... Um, you beat me to it. I was so excited to say that we get to oh, yeah. take one off. <laughs> yeah. Right. So anyway, that was my plan um, on, the, on the agenda. Everything else seems fine. Any other thoughts from the board on items to add or change on the agenda for the 20th of May? Well, just if we are light and if we're going to bring in items off of future agenda items, you know, what's the most likely? Is it the math curriculum, just because you talked about that tonight, Bridget, or is it city school long-term investment strategies, just because, oh my God, <laughs> the economy? Uh, well, I wasn't trying to try to do all of them, and some of them are going to either pop up, in, you know, in some of our upcoming monitoring ones, but I was going to try to take off a good number of them that I could, probably nutritional services, screening, pro, uh, screening and fingerprinting process, uh, update on the dual litigation um, technology in the classroom. I think I can do that now um, and where we are. Um, so I was going to just take some of those, Brian, and try to get them off. Um, again, I'm, I am trying to be conscious of what I got going on with some of like the central office folks, including Mike with the, with the current stuff we're doing right now is definitely has a load, but um, yeah, yeah, fair enough. that was what I was going to try to fill. So yep. that was my thinking. Good. Okay. All right. Um, so that's the agenda for May 20th. And we kind of covered future agenda items right along. Were there any other thoughts for things we needed to add to a future agenda um, under item number 13 on tonight's agenda? Um, Bridget, this is not for our exclusive agenda, but I do think we should be starting to think about how we will conduct a steering committee meeting with the city as we have planned um, and as is required by charter. So uh, I'll put that on the next meeting David and I have with the city, but um, just wanna remind folks that that's also an obligation um, we, we have and one of mutual interest to our shared taxpayers. Okay, great. That's good. All right, uh, then moving right along to item number 14, consider the minutes of the meeting of April 27th. This was a Monday morning um, negotiations planning uh, executive session. Yeah, my only objection there is that Burkhart left at 9.08 and seconded at 9.13. <laughs> yep, not sure how that happened. <laughs> Yeah, we got gotcha you on that one. Isn't that yeah. the one where? Um, and that's one where I did jump off. I had to jump off because someone else in the house needed bandwidth for their yeah. Zoom call. Um, so I was not the one who seconded Made to close motion. that meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hmm. I'll look at that who did that. Thanks. Yep. Okay. Excellent. Okay. So will we bring those back then, or do we? I think you're gonna you can approve it with the. Oh, let's approve them with that amendment. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's okay. minor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. So item number fifteen, the consent agenda. David, did you want to say a couple of words yeah. about the folks who yeah. are retiring? Yeah. Thanks, um, Bridget, for that. Um, before I do the the thanks um, and recognition of the consent agenda, I'm gonna go out a little bit, and I just want to thank you know both Cole and Delaney for being on. I obviously thanking you, the board, for, you know, 
being diligent with Zoom and spending the time that you have. So I just want to thank the board, but uh, specifically the school, the student reps, you know, just been impressive. They've been doing all the things that they need to do and providing such good insight. And so I just want to thank both Delaney and Cole personally for, for being on tonight and, and past nights and just doing a great job, really helpful, great. Um, on the consent agenda, we have two individuals. We have Kathy Buley um, is a retirement and Callie Flickinger, she's a 0.8 library media specialist um, also at the Chamberlain School. So both have been longtime Chamberlain teachers and uh, Callie Flickinger has been our li library media specialist and, and tech integration person. Uh, she has been with us uh, for the about 16 years. And, um, you know, she's done just such a great job, such a compassionate, caring um, person, loves children. I've had the opportunity to do these um, library evening hours and read a, read a book of, of interest to students. And, um, you know, she's just been instrumental in engaging the, the Chamberlain community. So again, she's gonna be really, really missed. She's been a special person. And then um, Kathy Buley has been um, with South Burlington for her entire career, uh, starting back, I think right around 1979. This is her 41st year. And, um, you know, she is just, uh, she truly, you know, exhibits love for all children. And I've just seen that firsthand, either in being in her classroom or seeing her around students, whether it's in the hallways or, or wherever. And she has just been a great, great um, teacher who uh, loves all kids. And uh, I just can't say enough about her and and, and her um, kind of just her, her career uh, as a teacher. And again, if you, if you see her today and inter interacting with kids, you'd see the same thing, just loves, loves and laughs with, with all, all kids um, regardless. So um, we're gonna miss both of them. But um, again, I'm, it's not really a great tribute at this point, given the number of years and what they've done, but thanks for giving me the opportunity to say a few things. Thank you, David. Bridget, could I also yes. add? Um, I, I do want to add, I've had both the personal and professional pleasure of working with Kathy Buley in her former capacity as co-president of the SBEA, and uh, I would be remiss not to share uh, uh, the, the recognition that David has also shared. Um, she is a consummate professional, and I had an opportunity to see her at the school at Chamberlain. Gosh, it feels like a year ago, but it might have been a month ago. I don't know. <laughs> but um, she was very welcomed by the Chamberlain community back for a, um, a blood drive that actually was done in her honor. And uh, um, she, uh, she just lights up the room. And uh, again, I wanna thank her for all her hard work for the district over many, many years. Yeah, it's, it's fitting um, today. They had a um, Chamberlain, I, I should have made this in announcements, but it's fitting um, given that we have two Chamberlain uh, retirees. They did a car parade today. Um, the bus went out for their normal delivery um, and teachers and staff followed along in, in their individual cars by themselves, decorated their cars um, and um, had a car, car parade. And um, a lot of parents were out, you know, thanking them. This was around one o'clock. And I think you'll probably see it on the news this evening or tomorrow morning, probably by the time you get a chance to see it. But um, again, a tribute to, again, the, the staff and, and certainly um, a lot of what Kathy and Callie have built over the years of that caring, trusting relationships. Thank you for that, David and Elizabeth. All right then, um, agenda item number 16, accounts payable order number 39. Were there any questions or comments by the board about the accounts payable order? Yeah, I did want to circle back. I, I was, and I can send this out to you too. But I, I got a we got a question from the board last meeting, and I just haven't had a chance to put it out it um, to you. But you asked specifically about the contracts, you know, being honored um, by like the Howard Center, and so I, I did indicate that yes, uh, that is that is um, correct uh, that we are in in this current condition. The clinicians that are contracted are still making those contacts with students and families although in a different way, um, but they are providing those services. And so um, question specific would be to savings, um, probably not much at this point, uh, services. Thanks. 
Any other board thoughts or questions? And I'm just double checking from the public. No hands raised or um, questions on that end. So do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. 